I'm Professor Jane Rayburn, and I'm a Professor of Media at Leeds Beckett. I'm very proud to say that I'm a colleague and friend of today's uh, talker, uh, Dr. Dan Kilverton. Now, Dr. Dan Kilverton is a senior lecturer in Media and Cultural Studies at the School of Cultural Studies and Humanities at Leeds Beckett University. He is one of the most prolific and dedicated researchers, and he engages in actual research. He's trying to make a difference to the world uh, through the work that he does. His research interests involve race, identities, new media, social media, and sport. He's very critically interested in online fandom and hate speech in football, and in fact, he's just recently completed a chapter on the same that was published this yesterday. yesterday. Yesterday, that's how live this stuff is. Um, but he's also interested in, in basketball and ice hockey, which I'm sure are not as good as football. I'm guessing, anyway. Um, he is analysing the embedded nature of stereotypes in his sports and in journalism, and he's also trying to think about how the impact of those ideologies are on people who consume that kind of media. He's published four books, um, both all of them highlighting historical and current reasons for the absence of British Asians from football, and he's also presenting policy recommendations for, for reform. Uh, you can Google him and you can find him on Twitter, so please do follow Dan Kilton. And you can also buy talk by him as well, because his research underpins our undergraduate and postgraduate provision at Media and um, at the University, just a bit of a plug. And today he will be speaking to us about the challenging the British football exclusion. So over to Dan. Thank you. That's the best introduction I've ever had. But it's all down here. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so welcome, everybody, and thank you very much uh, for attending. It's quite a lavish room, isn't it, actually? It's, it's very nice. I don't think I've ever presented anywhere like this before. Uh, so, yeah, as, as you can see, the title there is uh, Challenging the British Asian Football Exclusion. Now, I've been researching this, actually. This was the, the topic that I did for my undergraduate dissertation. That was quite a few years ago, I'm a bit grey now. Um, and I really got a bit obsessed and a bit addicted and my friends said, you know, my family, he's still researching this. And yes, because he needs researching because there is a, a real problem within the game at all levels. Um, so I got a bit carried away, I got a bit obsessed and, and this became an almost taken over my life for the last 11, 12 years. So it was my undergrad dissertation, then I did a master's looking at fandom and looking at British Asian supporters and, and exclusions and underrepresentations. Then I did a PhD and then I, I carried on going further. And then amazingly, one thing I never thought, I got my, my, my first solo, solo authored monograph uh, two years ago. And that's really what I'm gonna be talking through today, some of the key things within this uh, as well. Uh, so yes, welcome. Right, I'm gonna have to keep running round to do this. Okay, so just to outline what I'll be talking about, then I'll start by, if you can, if you can see that, okay. So looking at British Asians, now the best point out, we're looking at British Asian males rather than British Asian females. The chapter within the book does explore British Asian females within, within football, but I've got to choose a, a particular focus, so I'm going to talk today about British Asian males in football. Looking at why there is an exclusion, I'm going to try and ask people in the room just to, to maybe chat to, to people next to them and just try and think up maybe a couple of reasons why there might be this underrepresentation or exclusion that we do see. Then building on from that, trying to dispel some of the common myths and stereotypes that we see, we'll look at the real barriers. And again, I, I think within my work I identified about 37 different barriers, a lot of which overlap, but th those are the themes that came out from the research, from the investigations. I actually interviewed well over a hundred people from all levels of the game, from scouts, managers, coaches, professional players, amateur players, semi-professional players, parents, for example, as well, who'd supported their kids. Um, so we're going to look at the real barriers. I'm going to pick out a couple of those to talk through. And then we'll talk about challenging the exclusion. There's still a long way to go. There's still a lot of work to be done. And I'm going to talk exactly as Jane pointed out there at the start about kind of action research and impact research, so things that I've actually done to try and challenge this and actually not just put words on a page, but actually put that into practice and really try and challenge these problems that we see in the game. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna start asking you questions in a minute. Uh, the numbers, if we look at the, the, the kind of population statistics and we look at, we look at those, it's actually about five and a half percent, six percent British Asian. So that's defined as uh, Pakistani heritage, Indian heritage, uh, Sri Lankan, Bangladeshi heritage. So that's the largest minority ethnic, or BAME, uh, group. That's actually double that of the black British population, which is at 2.69, about 2 million. So therefore, you could look at that and think, well, 
If you look at these figures, then you might imagine there to be at least as many British Asian players as there are black British players in the, the game of football. And that's not really been the case. Who's, who's a football fan in this room? Okay, that's this side. <laughs> this side. So, decent crowd. Okay, you're in the right place. Um, those who don't like football, I'll try and make it really interesting. Um, okay, so you would imagine there to be at least as many numbers. I'm going to ask you the question now. If you've seen the little video which kind of plugged this talk, you've probably seen the answer's actually changed because I actually did a little bit more research and looked at those right now with professional contracts. When I actually gave that the figure in the little video, uh, that was from six months ago, so that figure's changed. So try and think of a number, and let me try and put this into context. But there's 3,700 players with professional contracts within English football. That's at the 92 football clubs at professional level. Over the age of 16, there's 5,200 players. Okay, 3,700 beyond the age of 18. Right, so how many British Asian professionals are there? Shout something out. 10. 10. Okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. Okay, that's, you, you don't win a prize. You, you don't win a prize. Uh, but that's good. Usually a lot of people might shout out 50 or 100 or zero or something like that, but no one's ever actually got the right. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a bit taken back by that. But that's really good. Okay, but 10. Okay, if you think about that, that's what, 0.01%. I'm not a mathematician, but if, if you can figure that out. But it's very, very, very minuscule. So, again, as a, as a kind of an undergraduate research, I had an amazing lecturer who kind of changed my life because he inspired me to really look into this and, and challenge these ideas and stereotypes that we see. Um, and, yeah, there's, there's, there's only 10. So what are the reasons for that, then? And that is what I really wanted to find out as well. So these are the 10, the 10 players that we, we have at the moment, uh, players who are playing for Leicester. A lot of these are actually about 1920. So they've not definitively made it. There are some on there who have Neil Taylor, who plays for Wales and plays for Aston Villa, uh, Easter Sullivan, Danny Bart, um, Marlon Benny. These are players who, who you would say have got a career in the game. The other ones are just starting out uh, as well. If we just look at the broader picture of that, that's 10 out of 3,700 at professional level. That's, that's very, very small numbers. If we look at... Um, you know, between 2009 and 2010 at academy level, so between the ages of 16 to 18 years old, in the football league, so that's 72 clubs below the Premier League, there was actually 13 British Asian players out of 1,300, okay? So even the step below professional level, these players are not really progressing through from academies to get those contracts. So again, why is that? If we look off the pitch and we look at coaches, coaches at senior level, within professional football. There's 482 in that position. And I think the number is there's 42 of those coaches are BAME, and there's only one British Asian coach at senior level in, in, in the game, and that's at Port Vale. And there's only one British Asian coach with a UEFA Pro license, okay? So what these statistics show is there's a massive either underrepresentation or a massive exclusion that we see. And those statistics have really puzzled me, and that's one of the, the reasons what's really pushed me forward to try and find out why. You know, why, why, is there, why is there this issue? Why is there this, this exclusion that we see? And that's why I'm actually going to throw it over to you just for 30 seconds. Talk to the person closest to you. <coughs> just try and put forward one or two reasons why there might be this exclusion that I've just pointed out. Good. <laughs> Okay, right, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. It's like an amazing seminar. Everybody's chatting, I really like that. I'm going to go, I feel like, if I go to Chris, I think that's cheap because he's actually doing a PhD on exclusion in football. So I feel like I'm, I'm going to go this side first, actually. What were you saying in this kind of group here? Right, so maybe cultural barriers there. 
potentially. Okay, very good point, yeah. Let's go towards the kind of middle group there. Any, any other ideas? We were talking about um, possibly religious backgrounds that if you were Muslim, um, you have quite a lot of commitment that means you might not be able to attend training sessions and things mm -hmm. um, that actually might get in the way, or possibly financial as well, because okay. you know, it takes a lot of money to actually get you through the academies and things, transport. Mm -hmm. If parents have to work, they can't necessarily take you, so that could influence it as well. Okay, so cultural and religious barriers again, building on the parental support as well. Good, good point. Uh, again, over, over at the back area there. Um, we chatted about, so I had a lot of friends who went through like the YT system, um, 16 to 18, and even though they were white males, that if you didn't kind of fit into that like toxic environment of, inside the shaming room, being yeah. part of that, you were ostracised and you didn't feel a part of it. Yeah. Um, that the lavish culture of football. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> Did you play football as well? Yeah. yeah. Go through that system? Not through that system. Not okay. right. But you've seen that, haven't you? Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. it's very One of the friends who was in that team played some songs in our league. Nick Taylor. Jan Pepper. Holly Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Right, good. Right, good. Uh, yeah, we'll go on to that side. Anything else? Uh, I think just in terms of, if you looked at those players, most of them were associated with broadly speaking Midlands clubs. Mm. And there are large concentrations of Asian populations in those areas as well as elsewhere. But if you go to the grounds, Supporters is minimal, and mm. many of those players are right in the middle of the Asian business communities. Yeah. So that lack of connection in terms of passive interest. Mm. I think, for example, West Brom and Leicester have been very, very good at actually bringing players mm. through. But if we go further up north, those clubs mm. perhaps haven't been as bringing those players through. Bradford, Leeds, etc. Or even just getting them into the ground. Into the ground. Yeah. 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 Mm. I'll touch upon that later as well. And at the back, anything? Um, yeah, the kind of lack of funding and general lack of opportunities directed towards these communities. Okay, right, so maybe a lack of opportunities there. Okay, good. Over the top to this side. Um, we covered um, cultural barriers, as you said, because I come from a um, Pakistani Muslim background, um, so I would see that children were a lot pushed into academia uh, as a career and as a life choice as opposed to taking sports or hairdressing or beauty of the life mm -hmm. choice that those weren't seen as um, as a professional career choice. Yeah. Um, so I think kids were just sort of pushed um, into going to schools, universities and getting professional jobs that were seen as more um, perhaps a bit more have a bit more um, what's status. status about yeah. them. Yeah. Okay, very good. So picking up on those cultural barriers as well again. And then finally Okay, so which nobody's mentioned so far. Okay. Okay. We also talked about particularly sports and much greater concentration um, Asian people in cricket, for example. Okay, so maybe other sports competing against, against football, cricket might be more popular. But then we've got things like institutional racism uh, bringing that in at the end. Um, and again, everything we just mentioned there, of course, they came up within the research and I'll be picking up um, on a lot of the discussions there as well. So, one of the common sense rationales that I've, I've put forward, and you hear these all the time, and I've heard these from when I've been doing interviews with scouts and coaches, for example, and even British Asians themselves have said things about race, um, and I'm using that race in a, as a social construction, there is no such thing as race from a scientific point of view. From a biological point of view, it is a, it's a myth, it's a lie. However, some of the scouts have kind of said things to, to suggest that British Asians might not be physical enough. British Asian men might not be able to uh, kind of compete against black players or white players, for example. So that's very much a, a racialised perception of British Asian bodies that we see in the game. A, a really famous uh, football manager said in the 1990s, um, the British Asian frame is not that of a professional footballer. Maybe it's because of the diet they intake, but they cannot build up a physical frame. Okay, if we just unpick that a little bit. Um, that's suggesting British Asians therefore eat curry or something like that, which is not healthy and therefore they've got the wrong diet, therefore they're not physically. I mean, you've got to then think, if that's somebody running a football club, what's their scouting recruitment system going to be like? 
Now, that's not an uncommon thing that I've heard. That's going back to 1996. But within my work, I've seen things and heard things which raise eyebrows, which are very uh, odd to be, to be saying in this contemporary time. But this idea of physicality does come into it as well. And there has been an internalisation of these stereotypes as well. Like I've actually interviewed you know, young amateur British Asian footballers who do actually say the same things, and they even subscribe to this as well. Um, so, but there's some problems around that, obviously, and I'll kind of go through that in a moment. The next one is, is culture, and we've picked up on that. And again, that's always put forward the idea that education is more important than football or, or any other sports, or that within football there's very few role models there to aspire to, whereas in cricket, you know, people like Sachin Tendulkar, and, you know, even the, the British Asian cricketers, we see Monty Panasar, etc. Those are role models that show that you can do that. Whereas in football, there's only 10 at the moment. There's never been that kind of prolific, high-profile high uh, player playing for England from a, a South Asian background. So those are the, the, the common barriers that we see. Now, <laughs> I'll get onto that, that uh, oral testimony in a moment. That's from a professional, uh, a professional club scout uh, who was in charge of deploying scouts out across the country to find players. Now, the common stereotype we see, and this goes all the way back to colonial times, and Yahal talks about this, the standard stereotype of South Asian people is that one of submissive or naturally placid or physically frail or weaker. That's been there and embedded, but perhaps within the, the white racial frame or the psyche for generations, okay, smaller, slighter, etc. And that's arguably fed down to some of the scouts who are making, making these decisions to send scouts out to, to view different players. And when they view these players, are they viewing them fairly or are they viewing them with a, a sense of racial bias in some way? So, this is uh, probably one of the worst um, <laughs> comments I got back. So basically my question was, you know, where are the British Asian footballers? Why are there so few? And um, he said, they don't like physical contact. I think that's their problem. Why are they good at cricket? Why are they absolutely exceptional at squash? Why do they not participate in any other sports where there are physical contact? rugby football. I mean, they do participate, but not to the highest level. Then he, he wanted to uh, kind of summarise for me, uh, which was very kind of him. He said, well, really, <laughs> it's, it's talent-wise, <coughs> physical contact and an understanding of the game. Okay? So this professional scout whose job is to send scouts out to different areas of the country. And this is a, a club within uh, an area with a, a densely populated British Asian area. Now, Reading that, are those British Asian players at British Asian clubs um, going to be seen? Um, my answer would be no, looking at that. So, you know, they don't like physical contact. That's homogenising entire communities together. Um, that's their problem. So football's not a problem. It's not institutional racism in any way whatsoever. Overt racism, not a problem. But that's their problem. So it's British Asians who are the problem within this, within this context. Why are they good at cricket? Why are they good at squash? Why don't they participate in football or rugby? They do participate. They do. That's a fact. Um, you know, talent-wise, they're not good enough. Homogeneously, not good enough. Physical contact, all cannot partake in sport where, where it's physical. An, un under an understanding of the game, now that's quite potentially ambiguous, is that an understanding of the, the history and the culture of football, or is it actually a mental capacity that British Asians don't understand that they've got to get a ball in a goal. You know, I'm white, you know, and, and you know, I struggle with that, so a British Asian. <laughs> I mean, how illogical is that? Okay? Now, that's not just a one off. Those are comments that I've heard uh, several times within the, within, within the game. All we need to do as well is look at kind of the idea of empirical falsification that disproves that. And that those are just some examples of, of British Asians or uh, South Asians competing within physical sports. Ikram Buff, Anwar Rudi. I've actually played football uh, with uh, Anwar. He used to play for Kids at West Ham. Um, you know, physical guy. If I went up to him and I said, I think you're physically frail and naturally classic, <laughs> I wouldn't be here talking to you, I tell you that. Um, you know, so this, this is a logical race, isn't, is not. Uh, a reality, it's not a biological reality, it doesn't exist. The scientific community turned its back on race back in 1964. Since the, the end of the Second World War, biological notions of race do not exist. There is no proof of this. There's actually greater 
genetic variation within racial groups, then outside racial groups, we're 99.9% .9 biologically the same across any racial group. So to suggest that British Asians are not good enough simply because of biology does not make sense, and it's actually scientifically discredited and illogical. Okay? That's the first point. And even if you think, take that step, I just love this quote. This is actually from my first book, um, so I'm, I'm just going to showcase that. Did you hear the article arguing that the composition of the European Ryder Cup team demonstrated the white race's innate ability to swing a stick in a pendulum motion? Or did you read the quote from the biologist claiming to have identified a golf gene in some of the whiter tribes of deepest Surrey? Okay, if you think about that, when whites do <coughs> that in sport, well, nobody questions it's down to race or skin colour. But when a black person does well in sprinting, it must be because biologically they're different in some way. They have fast twitch muscle fibres. Again, there is no study that's ever conclusively come near proving this at all. But we flip it round. When, when a group does well in sport, it must be because of race, if they're, if they're people of colour. If they don't do well in sport, well, it must also be because of race. Nobody questions white people playing sport and doing well in sport. That's because of culture and hard work. Flip that round. That argument is ridiculous. Okay, so that's, that's one. Let's disprove race. The next one is culture. We've picked up on that already, haven't we? So we've talked about this idea that maybe cricket is more important, or badminton, or, or squash, something like that. Whereas football is seen as kind of less important, or, or an unimportant subculture. Now, again, asking uh, scouts and coaches within the game, what are their perceptions of this? Well, very nice chap. But what he said is, you know, their traditional game is cricket, so uh, their kids may well, well be guided towards cricket. I've got a granddaughter, she's got a football because her grandfather's a football coach. That almost suggests that cultures stay static and they do not move at all. And that's not the case, but culture moves forward. It's progressive all the time. Think back to your grandparents, think to your parents, think to you. If you've got kids, think to them. Culture changes with successive generations. So to suggest that British Asians from the first generation to the second generation to the third generation still will not like football is untrue. Okay? Things change, things move on. In fact, 26 years ago, 27 years ago, there was a study done by Manchester University. They actually found that British Bangladeshi boys, young boys, actually play football at higher levels than young white boys. 60% okay? of young British Bangladeshi boys played football regularly. 43% uh, of young Pakistani boys played football regularly. 36% of British Indian boys played football regularly. That's in comparison to 47% of young white British boys who played football regularly. So su to suggest that it's unimportant or they don't understand or they're not interested in the game is, is again simply untrue. For second, third generation British Asians, football is massively popular. It's the number one sport, which I'm told time and time again. I've seen that. I've been to football fields in Bradford and conducted interviews and observations and uh, people think I'm like a tax collector when I say that. <laughs> it's a little dope, um, <laughs> one person actually thought I was doing the GCSEs, uh, <laughs> which, which was nice, um, before the beard. Um, but, but yeah, there's this idea that the kids here now, it, it's football, it's football, football, football all the time. Cricket has kind of declined in popularity, um, as, as that suggests. Um, and if we, if we then trace back football to, to the Indian subcontinent, you know, is, do you think it's a relatively new sport, football, for people in India? When do you think the first, like, when do you think the first leagues were set up in India? Any ideas? 50s? 1880s. The, the league were just set up in the 1880s. Cups were being played, T you know, teams were formed. So it's not a new sport. When, when British Asians, you know, in, in, the, in the kind of the Windrush or the, the second, uh, second World War, moved across, it wasn't an alien concept that what's this football, what do we do? It had been part of that culture for 70 years before. It wasn't a new thing. So to suggest that cricket is the number one, it doesn't change. <coughs> Uh, just completely forgets that history and relationship with football that occurred before the migration. Okay, so that's the, the culture uh, aspect as well. Now, one thing that that, that does is when scouts or coaches or people within the game 
suggest that uh, it's down to race or genetics or biology or culture or parents don't support uh, or simply cricket's the number one sport, etc. It almost shifts the blame, doesn't it? So it's suggesting that there's a reason for this exclusion, and that's because British Asians have excluded themselves rather than football <coughs> not being welcoming or opening to British Asian football communities. Now, if we look at the more sinister side, side of this as well, there's key barriers that we see. So those are five that I've actually pointed out. I mean, we did actually mention religion and madrasa classes, and that's something that we actually do, uh, I do talk about in the book there. Um, but I want to really focus on those three at the top. So overt racism, grassroots level. Overt racism exists throughout all forms of football. It, you know, it still exists in all forms of society. Um, we've also got covert racism. The other word for covert is institutionalised or hidden forms of racism that also exists. And I think we've touched upon that already, but we're talking about how the recruitment system is overlooking certain communities when it comes to scouting networks. That, by definition, is institutionalised racism because there's not this equality of opportunity there. And the next one is looking at opportunities and looking at growing the football infrastructure. So again, I'm going to talk through these three and again show some of the comments and the interviews that I've heard in relation to these uh, over the last few years. I, don't, I won't read some of the words out there, but overt racism. I've interviewed many, many players out there who play at amateur level and semi-professional level. And for them, overt racism is a common aspect of the game. You turn up on a Saturday, you turn up on a Sunday, you're likely going to get some form of comment said towards you, some, some form of verbal abuse. And in 2011, when a lot of these were done, or 2000, you know, today in 2018, nobody should go play football and have to deal with some of these comments that are being said to them. Okay. The problem is a lot, a lot of people now are potentially thinking, well, it puts them off the game, it's maybe a bit of banter. It's not, it's all about racism by definition. It shouldn't be said. So one of the uh, semi professional footballers said, I've heard it a lot, you know, you should be working at a corner shop. On average, I probably hear that stuff once every two games. The next one, I can name the number of games on one hand where I haven't heard it. We've played 46 games. That was a, a goalkeeper. He did say that it was usually fans behind the goal. They would usually chip away and join the match. And nobody should have to deal with that during the game. So there needs to be tighter rules and regulations around policing overt racism at all forms, at amateur level and at semi-professional level. It's, it's really quite bad. And some of the stories that I've heard, some of the longer oral testimonies that I could have put in there, one was, um, you know, turning up uh, a predominantly British Asian team from London, turning up um, and the other team was kind of walking along and pretending to hide behind cars saying that they were going to blow them up is, is, is another one. Um, other ones where uh, actually the opposition players and fans had to try to knock them over in the cars before the match. Uh, other ones where people had run on the pitch and just started uh, hitting, hitting people with baseball bats. These are, com these are common occurrences uh, that, that happen. Um, not usually aired, but these, these are real issues. Overt racism is still a problem. Now, if you're competing week in and week out in, in a very toxic environment, I think that word was mentioned already, if you're competing on a Saturday, <coughs> on a Sunday, playing football, and you're going to get this, a lot of people I've spoke to have ended up walking away from the game and actually playing just with their friends and playing in unstructured environments. And you can't blame those people because who would want to play in that environment? turning up every, every week in, in fear. One final one was uh, a semi-professional player was, was playing and he'd, he'd done his, uh, his leg, broke his leg in two places, he was on the floor, coming in and out of consciousness and people on the sidelines were just telling him to, to get up and go back to the corner shop. You know, it's, it's quite awful, these experiences that I've heard over the years. And again, that's something that I do talk about in the book. And that's one of the, the, the reasons why people do step away from the game and don't take it further. So more needs to be done around policing this. The next one looks at the most, more hidden forms of racism, more institutionalised racism, the more covert forms of racism. Now, if we go back to, uh, again, comments that I've heard, um, you know, scouts or coaches will say, well, <laughs> British Asians like to keep themselves to themselves, they don't want to integrate within the kind of the mainstream structures. 
And the, there are, or there has been, the, the Asian Football League, the Asian Premier League down in, uh, down in London. Uh, there's some Asian, uh, predominantly British Asian cricket leagues, the Kaidi Azam Cricket League in Bradford is one example. Now, from football insiders, they would suggest, well, they don't want to integrate. It's their problem. Blame the blame. Let's not reach out. They're the ones with the issue. That's the common kind of consensus that I've heard. The problem is, though, is that because we have kind of separatist football clubs, or predominantly British Asian football clubs, due to these stereotypes that we're talking about, is that they remain really unlikely to be identified by professional scouting networks, um, which is a major issue. Now, again, when a white team is white in football, nobody says, nobody says look at those whites, they like to stick together, that's a problem. But when a, a, a British Asian team is predominantly British Asian, the comments you get is well, they like to stick together, they don't want to integrate, like it's their problem. But a football club represents geography, it represents friend networks, it's quite a normal thing. But surely the, uh, the recruitment system should <coughs> visit these different places to find different players, rather than sticking to the same leagues, which is what they do. So it's very rare that they'll actually go outside these, these areas. If there's established leagues and established networks, these coaches and these scouts will visit these established leagues and networks. And therefore that's uh, overlooking you know, thousands and thousands of players over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, as well. Um, and also going back to this, if, if we look at these all Asian environments, the reason why those all Asian environments were formed in the first place is because there's, there's evidence which Yahal talks about where British Asians uh, who kind of first generation come over, they wanted to join clubs. But as they went there, they were met with this non-welcoming exclusionary policy. They were verbally abused or physically attacked. They had no other choice but to set up their own clubs, their own environments. But these environments have kind of gone on, but they've been overlooked by the system. Okay? So it's about diversifying those scouting networks. And, uh, again, these are some of the uh, interviewees' responses in terms of scouting networks. So, Looking at, uh, this is from Bradford for example, we've, we've had talented players, the lads have done well in the leagues, but I've never seen a scout down to watch a match in 18 years. We've got certain clubs where they've got the best players in the league and scored the top goals, not being seen. And, and this is, this is uh, one of the, the most shocking ones really. This is from the Midlands, so we, have, we never ever get any scouts down to watch us. One scout did actually relate to us the words of another scout. We were told that the scout was asked whether he was going to watch this particular Asian club or predominantly British Asian club. His statement was, there's no way I'm going to go watch a bunch of kick a ball around. And that's, a, that's a, a scout at a professional club. So again, it feeds into what I said earlier. There's not this equality of opportunity that's there. Scouting networks historically and still do, do, do overlook British Asian uh, football communities. Um, and it's those perceptions that maybe they're not good enough, maybe they're not strong enough, maybe the culture's not right. It's, it's shifting the blame onto those British Asian football communities rather than actually uh, widening the talent search. So again, that is institutionalised racism. Within my work, I've actually interviewed uh, many scouts and some clubs who've been very hostile with me because when I'm saying, do you, uh, have you searched for British Asian players? Do you diversify your scouting network? They think I'm accusing them of being racist, um, so they will just basically say everybody's equal, we don't look at colour, we don't look at anything like that. That is a, a colour blind notion of race, which essentially upholds racism because it's not challenging it. So it's quite ironic some of the things that actually tell them. But they do get very defensive when you try and ask these questions because it's a very sensitive topic. But we need to try and change that and diversify these scouting networks or nothing will change. Some clubs are, you know, there is some progress, a lot of, there's some clubs out there doing quite good work, but there's still a long way to go. The third one, I think we mentioned, we said lack of opportunities, <coughs> we said lack of opportunities, yeah. And, and there is, um, now, within, say, West Yorkshire, within Bradford, Manning and, and uh, you know, Girlington, and, you know, BD3, BD5, those particular environments which are densely populated British Asian environments, there are a lack of clubs in comparison to the, the whiter or more rural areas as well. And one of the reasons for that is that they've got to set up their own infrastructures. 
So as I said, a lot of these players during the first generation would go on to, so, to the existing white structures and white clubs, but they weren't welcome. So they set up their own. So they've had to, to find things from scratch and create new clubs and new infrastructures. But these areas, and again what I've been told is a lot of these areas uh, have problems with facilities, actually gaining access to, to pitches, um, and also economic barriers as well, which we mentioned uh, briefly before. And again, what some players have had to do, who've actually gone on and, and made it semi-professional or even professional, they had to move out of these, these areas to actually join a white club, which was quite challenging. They had to get on three or four different buses, I was told, to actually go find this white club and meet new people. Now that can be quite intimidating for anybody, but when you're stepping outside your comfort zone, some players have had to do that. The players that have done that have actually had more success by doing that rather than staying there because they're more likely to be spotted, because the recruitment system is more likely to see those players. Um, yeah, so for, for those living say, in the city of Bradford, and again, I did a lot of research <coughs> within Bradford, which is obviously where I'm from, you can probably tell by my accent. And uh, there are fewer pathways into grassroots football in both adult and junior spaces. Now for first generation, uh, the, the key thing was kind of the home, it was security, it was earning money, it was education for the family putting food on the table, that was the first generation's main priorities. Probably wasn't football. Second generation, progressive generational difference, things change. Sport and leisure pursuits become more important, the increase in popularity. Now we're talking third, fourth generation. Football's the number one. There are opportunities springing up now, but as, as I've said, uh, the, the common mantra I'm saying is that there's still more work that needs to be done. So, we've got five minutes or so left. Now, Challenging the exclusion. Part of my work, and as James said right at the start, um, I think I need to just, uh, just have a drink. Mm -hmm. Speed talking for 40 minutes, it's sexy out here. So, challenging the exclusion. There, there are things being done to, to, try and, to try and really change this now. Now, the first report into British Asians and football, and actually highlighting this, this as an issue, was done in 1996. And it was the ironic title, Asians Can't Play Football Report by Dainton Patel. They actually put forward, it was a really good study, they actually put forward a load of recommendations, um, a lot of interviews that they did, and surveys, and it was a brilliant report. But nothing was really done after that. Then they did a follow up report back in 2005 called Asians Can Play Football. Again, nothing was really done after that. Ten years after that, the FA. Was the, it was the first time the FA had ever actually released any kind of plan to really target British Asians in football and actually try and increase participation in all forms of the game. So that was called bringing opportunities to communities. They went around, uh, I think it was eight or ten densely populated uh, British Asian areas across the country, held forums and focus groups at these professional clubs. I went to uh, one or two of them and you just participate and say the reasons of why there might be these barriers. That was done in 2015. The kind of success of that is, remains to be seen, um, but at least, at least they're actually trying to do something about it now. At least the FA has actually put forward a plan to remedy this. <coughs> they're in the second stage of that plan, and the 2018-2019 plan will be released soon. We've also got the coach bursary scheme, which tries to look at uh, an increase in the numbers of coaches and help there. We've got BAME coach mentors, Asian Star Initiative, which is uh, based at Chelsea. That gets a lot of uh, critique, really, uh, because it's seen as a one-off thing. Uh, British Asian players uh, turn up to uh, an event and the winners win a year-long trial at Chelsea Football Club. I think that sounds really good. A lot of people have criticised it saying it's just a one-off event, it needs longevity, etc. But having interviewed Chelsea and found out about what they do, they actually do work all, all year round, work with local mosques, etc. So they actually are doing good stuff. That's one success story of one club doing really, really good work. You've got fans with diversity, I think we mentioned fans earlier on, that was Andrew, BME, uh, Referee Bursary. And then finally I'm going to talk through what I mentioned at the start, which is creating and developing coaches, which is something I formed in April 2016. And I'm going to talk through that. And really, what that's doing is, is that's essentially putting, you know, 10 years of research and talking about this and speaking to loads and loads of different people about it. And then I put forward recommendations for reform within this book. 
And then within the same year this was published, I was actually putting forward one of the key ones within here into real life. And that's one of the real privileges of being an academic, is having the support of the university who will allow you to, to fund things that you've been talking about for 10 years and you actually get the opportunity to put it into practice and try and make a difference in people's lives and improve them. Uh, and I hope that I've done that in some way and I'll, I'll talk through uh, kind of what I've done in a moment. So, challenging the, the exclusion, this is a, a quote from kind of towards the end of the book. And developing grassroots clubs in these predominantly British Asian environments where there are a lack of opportunities and there are a lot of scouting networks, we need to develop clubs and we need to develop this infrastructure in those, in those areas. And that's fundamental if we're going to get players coming through. And again, one of the uh, a nice, uh, this is from an interview a few years back, you've got to create the, na the right natural environment. You can't expect a revolution. It's a player revolution that we need to try and get more players into the game, playing football at grassroots level. And then from that, then we can go from there. But we've got to get the players playing in, uh, in organised structures, rather than just within friendship groups, outside the system, we've got to get these players coming through. So it's about creating these opportunities and making sure that they're sustainable. In order to create opportunities for players, who do we need? There we go. Okay, that's it. We need coaches, we need volunteers to actually coach these, these kids uh, at all ages. We need that. So therefore, as a researcher, I've spent a long time looking at participation and players and, and the barriers that players face in getting into the game. Now I'm looking at coaches and the barriers that coaches face because that's one of the key problems. We need more coaches to therefore allow opportunities for these players. So then I've got to start thinking, I need to investigate the barriers that coaches face. So that's what I, that's what I started to do. So the last maybe three years, I've been looking at the, the barriers towards black Asian minority ethnic coaches and I've just published something around British Asian coaches and the barriers that they face as well. The three things that we'll highlight is, is access into the game okay, and networks. It was racism and stereotype and this perception that British Asians uh, can't coach or are not good enough simply because of their appearance in some way. Uh, um, qualification, um, things like that, is this idea that some people have said to me, they feel like they're suspicious of them in some way, like, what, what are they doing here? Um, which is a form of inferential racism. And we've also got role models as well. There's a lack of role models out there in terms of coaching to aspire to do, which is what I mentioned right at the start. So, I did that. I did some research into the barriers that coaches faced, and I tried to put forward something that addressed all of those barriers, and in turn would help create the players in, in the process. Hopefully you can keep it up with that. <coughs> And, uh, <laughs> a bit fuzzy. So I formed in April 2016 and I had a meeting with West Riding County FA. They were really, really supportive. They liked the idea. Um, so the first one we did at Bradford City in Valley Parade back in uh, April 2016. And what we wanted to do is really target current and aspiring coaches, you know, amateur coaches or people who have actually been in the game for a few years from kind of underrepresented uh, backgrounds. Okay, uh, particularly looking at British Asian communities as well. And the aim was really to showcase the opportunities that exist on, on your doorstep, okay? to highlight uh, opportunities that are there in the area, and to highlight pathways in the local football environment. We also wanted to facilitate networking so that they had contact, contact within the area. And we also wanted to highlight role models and inspire that football can be a career and can be a coach. Okay? It's not a, a, an excluded field. Uh, so, you'll see some nice photos on there that I'm making an appearance on this one. There we go, I wore a different shirt today. Um, so this is the first one we see, this is at Bradford City Valley Parade, so we've got a networking table going there. The way I describe it is it's essentially speed dating for coaches. So what I do is I invite six, six or seven different organisations from the local area who all offer opportunities to upskill these coaches in some way. Okay, um, and then I go around with a whistle, you know, kick the football theme like a referee, and every 10 minutes I blow the whistle, all the coaches get up and move to the next table, and then they do that for about an hour, okay? And then at the end of it, all the coaches, I've got all the information from all of these six different organisations, 
and they've got these contacts, they've got the numbers, and they can take these opportunities further from there. So really, it's speed dating for coaches, and how we usually start is with kind of a UEFA A or UEFA B licensed coach who has succeeded in the game, who is from an underrepresented community who can showcase that you can do it and be very, very positive and inspire these coaches as well. So we've got one at Bradford City, then we did Ellen uh, Road, we've got Huddersfield Town, then we are at Rastan, uh, we've done ones at Sheffield United, we've done the Etihad, uh, I'm doing one at the end of this month at Bolton, um, and uh, we've the follow up event to that, it's not just a one off, we're trying to have a follow up event, and we did the second one at the West Ryan County FA uh, last year and that was more of a practical session. The first one is all focused around networking, the second one is about practical skills, the third one is about employability and what these coaches actually want to do within the game. That's the, that's the model. Again, as a researcher, what I've been doing at all of these events for the last two years is handing around surveys, so I actually understand the barriers that these coaches who attend face, so I'm gonna be publishing the results from that within the next year or two. Um, and yeah, really learning what, what they want as well. Who do they want support from? How, how can I help? How can we help? Uh, how can the, uh, the local county FA help as well? <coughs> and final slide, because uh, I think I'm about out of time. Yeah, so over the last two years, we've worked <coughs> with uh, over 200 coaches across the country. So as I said, from West Ham to Sheffield to uh, the Etihad to next, uh, the end of the month, Bolton. Um, and we've had beginners there. We've also had UEFA A licensed coaches who've turned up to, to try and uh, enhance their networking. I've partnered with West Riding County FA, Manchester FA, Lancashire FA, and also the National FA as well, who've actually come and attended some of these meetings. Collaborated with a range of stakeholders, as I said, on each table we get different different kind of stakeholders that we're all offering opportunities from sporting equals to kick out etc um, and football in the community arms of these clubs turn up as well who are also offering opportunities for the coaches that attend and it has led to positive change um, not for everybody but if you can make a difference for five or ten percent you've made a difference in those people's lives so for example uh, it's led to employment opportunities for one of the coaches who attended I, I believe he was in a job that he didn't enjoy he never dreamed about working within football. Within six months of turning up to this event, he made a fantastic collaboration network. They helped him and put forward, uh, they, they helped him with his CV um, and put him forward for a particular role. Now he's working full time within football, uh, the only BA and E person within that department. Okay? So that's one positive thing that's changed from that. Uh, qualifications, so getting discount for qualification courses and coaching badges. Um, which Chris Yotting uh, did as well. Um, also, uh, <coughs> recruitment, due to the contact that was made there, one of the, one of the guys, his daughter, wanted to, to play football but didn't have an avenue in, and now she's playing for a professional academy. Okay, so there's another one. Um, and it also led to new inclusion initiatives. There's uh, several uh, of the attendees who turned up who actually went on to form their own inclusion initiatives after coming to this one. Um, and I think that is the end. So thank you very much Stan um, to show the importance of actually having research that makes a difference on the grassroots and makes a real difference to people's lives and to the culture in which we live. So has anybody got any questions for Dan? Oh the nice ones. Come on, please. <laughs> Can I get the back of myself that there is a lot of sports coaches, uh, some of whom are football um, invested? Uh, so my question is about what your assessment of coach training generally. I'm thinking specifically the coach's pedagogue, the coach's critical thinking, the coach is frankly an activist. I think the training that's available to football coaches ticks those kinds of boxes. <coughs> um. I'm not too sure, to be honest. I think I, I'm not a coach, so when I do these events, I facilitate them. So I leave all that stuff to the, the, the coaches out there. One thing I, I will say is that the, the people I've interviewed over the last you know, five, ten years, they've said that they, they don't necessarily feel too welcome within those environments. Um, 
th there's a lot of banter that goes on, which is kind of directed <coughs> towards them in some way, feel a bit ostracised. And I think that those environments and those, going for those coaching qualification courses need to feel more inclusive. Um, and, and again, that's one of the common things that comes out there. My question was about the substance of the training. I mean, I, I, I got an email from one of these coaches. Mm. He said, I've been, I've been a football coach for six years and it's the first time I ever thought it was anything other than just teaching kids how to play football. Yeah. You know, that seems to be part of the story. Oh, yeah. I mean, they obviously become role models as well, don't they? The, the kids but can look up to You have to be thinking as an educator, don't you? Yeah. Almost. Yeah. I think it's, that's a good question. It's probably one I can't fully answer just because I've never gone on to get the badges. I, any, any questions like that come my way, I usually say, speak to Steve uh, at, the, at the FA. Yeah, that's in chapter two. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a good question, um, and I've, I've had that before. So I think, as as a white researcher, when you are interviewing uh, a white football scout, you do feel like the guard is down, and they they almost think that they're on the right wavelength or the same wavelength as you. As you. Um, if that researcher was uh, BAME, arguably they'd be more defensive in terms of what they're saying. On the flip side, yes, I think that when, when I first started entering the field and I didn't have many contacts, I would interview the players, for example, and one of the questions what I'd, I'd ask you was after you warmed up into the interview and got that rapport is, have you ever faced any form of racism or racial abuse in somewhere? And some, some players in interviews would kind of shut down at that and not really want to go into any detail whatsoever and be quite defensive. Again, if I was a BAME interview, interviewer, they might think I could resonate with that in some way. Um, I understand that as a, as a white researcher, I've not experienced racism to, to any extent like these players have. Um, so the, the type of data that you get might not be the same. Um, but as I've been doing this for you know, 2007, so 11 years, I know a lot of people within that network now. And some of them have even said, well, you're almost British Asian now. So, you know, the, the, I think they've kind of accepted me. And as a researcher, you go beyond just researcher interviewee. You almost build up a, a form of friendship. So there's a lot of people in the game that I'm fairly close to, and I would call them friends now. I was just wondering, uh, do you have any recommendations you're making about food research? You kind of heard many issues as to how they are kind of getting away from the mouth of kind of grassroots level. I don't think it outworks really well in terms of professional and semi professional. And I know it does go further, but quite often, in terms of semi afternoon, the only person who's there is the referee and make the alliance. Mm. Have they put them in focus of how they intend to get out? Because that's the level where I could personally be losing a lot of players yeah. before we even consider it not to scout them more. Mm. If there's racism on a Sunday afternoon, you're just not going to continue playing. Well, that, that's a good question and it, it's, it's quite hard to, to answer. Um, I, do, I don't think the, the systems are robust enough. I don't think the penalties are severe enough. It, it goes unchallenged and I think sometimes there's, there's an emphasis on the accuser to actually try and prove that they've actually been verbally abused in some way. And that's, that's probably not the approach we should, we should, be, we should be taking. I think the referee should have a bit more support and a bit more power. Um, but I mean, that's, that's a whole new avenue for research as well. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, within, within, the, within the book, actually, do put forward recommendations for actually how to police that in a better way. Those haven't been put into practice. Um, and I, I still think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, especially <coughs> in Nottingham. Yeah. Um. So we have this level of protection starting from a young age for children getting into football and let's say they get onto the pitch and they're playing amongst other British Asians. How are we sustaining um, the protection that we've had through the ranks against other players because when we still can't prevent other players from being either covertly 
racist. Um, I mean, in cricket, for example, you see a lot of sledging going on, and people make all sorts of comments. Moyne Ali's um, recent what he put in his book. How do we prevent players from being racist? Together? How are we going to sustain that? If we, if and when we do get more British Asians on the pitch, and not only that, there's a different culture in football in Britain than there is anywhere else in the world and a lot of British Asians, and I speak on behalf of perhaps Muslim players that might not subscribe to the culture in terms of the parts of past cars and the drinking and the womanising that goes on and I do feel that that might be uh, they might not subscribe to that and that might make them not be part of the circle or the community of the rest of the football yeah, um, I, I think the wider debate there is it's, it's education, isn't it? Maybe, maybe not just the football. Yeah, so we've, 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 the, got, we've got the coaching, we're, yeah. we're, we're giving that kind of um, education to the coach so we can identify these, these players um, based on their talent and pushing them through the ranks. But it's the other players that unfortunately are racist. Um, and how do we get them to? kind of leave that behind. Yeah, I think w within football, we mentioned earlier, this is that idea of banter. And if it's on the pitch, um, even you know the former head of FIFA did say that we can settle racism with a handshake. You know, leave it on the pitch, it's done. There's this idea that it's banter, it's, it's trying to put them off the game and that's fine. But essentially, as you said, it is overt racism. So I think going, building on the, the, the question before, I think one of the things I actually say in the book is that at the start of the season, that the referee should really clearly state what is acceptable and unacceptable behaviour, just so all the players have heard that at the start of the, the grassroots football season, for example, what will not be tolerated. That would be one way to really put out there an educational <coughs> message um, so that the, the, the no, it's not banter, it's all about racism, you're going to get sent off. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it's true, wider. You know, we, we do need a wider education around you know, what, what's acceptable and unacceptable today. And I think that in recent years, we've almost taken a bit of a step back, haven't we? Which is worrying. And I thought we were progressing forward. And um, the far right's kind of yeah. back in again. Um, and it is worrying. But within football, I think the referee could do something there. Maybe the, the, uh, the website where the players go to obviously check the leagues and the scores, there could be messages on there. There could be some training online that these players could subscribe to. There's, there's ways we can do it, but we've got to get buy-in to do that. We've got to change I mean, that, I mean, I struggle. I mean, this isn't even in a football context. But I, I mean, I don't drink and I don't kind of do the whole the, go, the going out scene. And I'm just wondering, as a, as a Muslim footballer, and yeah, there's plenty of them in the Premiership, so I, and I don't know what kind of experiences they have. But if they're not sort of subscribing to that, um, do then they feel excluded in their own in their own communities? So they might have done all the hard work to get onto the pitch, but then they're not welcomed by the team members. Mm -hmm. And football players, as you know, just get pushed from pillar to post as and when um, they're swapped between teams. And but they, yeah, I mean, one of the, some of the players that I spoke to have actually forged a career in the game. and said, "You have to be so thick-skinned to actually succeed in this environment." because it's hard and you get those comments, those sort of kind of microaggressions but also the comments all the time um, and yeah there's got to be a level of being thick skinned but it comes down to education I think that's really important and that's probably that message isn't there strong enough at the moment. Did you, did you find any difference between Muslim <coughs> Asians and non-Muslim Asians? Um, yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some additional barriers that British Muslim players would face. So, for example, the madrasa classes that we mentioned earlier, they take place at the time when football academies have the training. Now, football academies who have spoken to said, said would you be kind of flexible in this? Uh, they said, absolutely not. We have training at that time and that's it. There are some clubs <coughs> who have been flexible in their approach to madrasa classes to actually get Muslim players in, but generally, this, the, the line I'm told is football will not change. Mm. So it's down to those communities to integrate within rather than football changing. That's an issue. Um, so yeah. Stop there, I'm afraid. Okay. So can we just uh, turn it down again?